everyone, and a special welcome to our Canadian viewers, because tonight we will help to celebrate Canada's most prestigious literary award, the Scotiabank Giller Prize. The 2021 winner of the Giller Prize is Omar El Akkad for his novel, What Strange Paradise. We want to thank the Giller Foundation for making tonight's event possible because we are thrilled to have Omar here with us. The program will be hosted this evening by Hal Wake. If you are a seasoned San Miguel Writers Conference attendee, you already know our beloved Hal. Hal Wake has been engaged in the literary community in Canada for more than 30 years. In the mid 1980s, he was the book producer for CBC Radio's Morningside with Peter Gazowski. He has hosted or moderated more than 100 literary events at festivals in Canada and internationally. Recently, he was the artistic director of the Vancouver International Writers Festival. He's beloved across Canada for his in-depth literary expertise and his brilliant interview style. As you listen to Hal Wake and Omar al Akkad. If you have questions, click on the Q&A button on your Zoom screen and type them in. And later, we will invite you to come up onto the stage so that you can interact personally with Omar and Hal. So Hal, I'll turn the program over to you now. Welcome back to the San Miguel stage. Thank you so much, Susan, for that um, very kind and generous introduction. Uh, I hope I can live up to uh, how you've uh, promoted me. We'll see. Um, welcome to a special edition of the Distinguished Speaker Series. Um, many thanks to everyone who's worked diligently to ensure that the quality programming that we have come to associate with the San Miguel Literary Festival and Conference continues under what is for all of us really trying circumstances. It's a magnificent achievement to keep things going um, in, these, in these troubled times. And special thanks, of course, to the uh, Scotia Bank Giller Prize, the sponsor of the event. And finally, to Marilyn Simons, the proud and fearless champion of Canadian writing and writers here and in many other venues. She's actually responsible for the uh, Canadian presence at the festival to make it uh, really tricultural. And, and it's, a, it's a wonderful thing that the three countries can come together in this way. Um, as Susan mentioned, our featured writer is Omar El, um, Omar El Akkad. Well, Omar is as peripatetic as the characters in his latest novel, What Strange Paradise. He was born in Egypt, grew up in Qatar. He moved to Canada when he was 16 and finished his education here, worked for 10 years as a journalist at the Globe and Mail before turning to fiction. And he now lives in Portland, Oregon. In addition to winning the Giller Prize, the novel was on the best book of 2021, li 2021 lists in the New York Times, the Washington Post, NPR, and BuzzFeed. And it was recently chosen to be one of the five books for CBC Radio's Canada Reads program. Tommy Orange, who was a featured uh, author at this festival when we were last able to be together said, it is by turns tender and brutal in its truths. Omar El Akkad writes with such emotional precision, power, and grace. The backdrop is the all too common dehumanization of and then dismissal of refugees everywhere. The book devastates, uplifts, somehow together. But we are not really left with hope. That isn't the point. Asked, we're asked to witness, to see what there is with clarity and with fullness of heart. Wendell Stevenson in the New York Times said simply, I haven't loved a book this much in a long time. Please welcome Omar El Akkad. Hi. 
Thank you so much for doing this, first of all. Um, it's a privilege to be here with you. Um, we almost met in Vancouver at the festival uh, a long time ago. I was working up the nerve to come say hi. And then um, an, an author nearby who is much more talented and successful than I, I overheard them say to a friend, did you hear Hal is in the room? And the sense of awe with which they said it sort of uh, caused me to lose all my nerve. And I never, never worked up the courage to come say hi. Um, so I'll say it now. Hi, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, thank you for everything you've done for literature for well, decades thank you. now. Uh, and I wish we were in the same room. And I have to say, when I do those introductions and, and, and almost always with, please welcome, I really miss in these virtual things that the applause that comes after that, it's just, it feels sort of, please welcome. And then, but here we are, we'll just, there's virtual applause in our ears. You know, when I talk about writing introductions, um, I tell uh, young presenters, don't waste time on where the writer was born and grew up and all that sort of stuff. And I just broke my own rule, of course. But in your case, it seems not just relevant to the novel, but obviously also to who you are and your worldview. Yeah, very much so. I mean, um, so when it, I should apologize in advance. Um, 24 hours ago, our kids got pretty sick. So they're, they're here. If in the background you hear some coughing or you hear very opinionated takes on the nature of dragons, that's what's going <laughs> on. Um, yeah, I was, I was born in Egypt, um, but my father had to get out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, when I was about five, uh, the political and economic situation in Egypt, which has never been good, at the, certainly during my lifetime, uh, was especially bad. And uh, so my father found work in Qatar, which is this tiny little peninsula sticking out of Saudi Arabia. Um, that's sort of the story that shows up in the bio, but, but there's a backstory to that, which is that wasn't the first job he found. He was initially going to leave Egypt to go to Libya. Uh, he'd, found, he'd gotten an offer there. And so we're sitting in the airport, I'm about four years old, and we're getting ready to hop a flight to Libya. Um, but Arabic names are sort of your first name, and then your middle name is your father's first name, and so on and so forth. So my name is Omar Muhammad La'ed. My father's name is Muhammad Ahmed La'ed. Muhammad Ahmed is an incredibly common combination of names in, in the Arab world. Somebody on the terrorism watch list is, has the same name. We get taken into secondary. We miss the flight. My dad's job offer is revoked. And then a little while later, he gets a job offer in Qatar. Qatar then, you know, at the time was just stumbling onto the third largest natural gas reserves in the world, was about to become pound for pound the richest place on earth. So I end up spending the 11 most formative years of my life in the richest country on earth instead of Libya because of a coin toss at the airport. And so that really influenced, of, of all my sort of life experiences, the one that influenced most the structure of the book and the thinking about how much of this is chance and how much of this is determined before you have a say in it dates back to stories like that. But also as a journalist, you went back um, to cover conflict or try to cover conflict. Sometimes you were prevented from doing the job you were sent there to do. Did, how did that influence your sense of, of the region and your, uh, maybe more specifically, thoughts and views on migration? In a number of ways. I mean, one of them is that you, you learn the many different overlapping meanings of outside. So, for example, I was born in Egypt, but I left really early. And since the age of five and a half, I've been in British schools or American schools, which is why I sound like this. And so, in a sense, you kind of, you spend a lot of your life preemptively trying to prepare for which aspect of your identity the person is going to latch onto. You know, are they gonna hear that I'm Muslim? And that's the first thing that they decide to sort of base their vector of me on. Or are they gonna hear my voice and hear this accent? In which case it's an entirely different kind of treatment and so on and so forth. And then you get that in reverse coming home, coming to the country of my blood. Because I walk into the airport at Egypt, I was going back to cover the, um, the aftermath of the Arab Spring. I was still working at the Globe and Mail at the time. And I'm walking in the airport and I, I 
I come in with my Canadian passport. So this woman looks at me, you know, she's in customs and she looks at me and she knows, right? Like she can see right away. I look like every one of her cousins. And she opens the Canadian passport and she sees the name and she's like, okay, yeah, sure. Canadian, <laughs> you know, like, when did you leave? Yeah. And I immediately say in Arabic, like, I'm sorry, my Arabic is really poor because I left when I was five, but my accent is incredibly Egyptian. If, you know, being from Egypt in the Arab world is like being from South Boston. Like, you said it has, it's so identifiable and strong. Exactly. So it's like if I came onto this call right now and said, listen, I'm really sorry, but my English is not particularly good. I'm not very eloquent in this language. It, it would sound off, right? So immediately it's like you're a stranger, but you're not. And so that sense of just being off, a little bit off, was, was my first introduction back home. And then, of course, you're seeing this place in flux. You're seeing the president who's run the country for the entirety of your lifetime has just been deposed. And there is this low burning chaos. Nobody knows what the norms are going to be from this point onwards. And I think one of the reasons that, you know, it didn't quite succeed, whatever the Arab Spring is, didn't quite succeed in most places. Because so I think a, a significant percentage of the population said, you know what? We'll take authoritarianism. We'll take tyranny if we know what it is, as opposed to democratic uncertainty, as opposed to freedom, but nobody knows the norms anymore. And so I was plopped right in the middle of this. And I was covering it for people on the other side of the planet. And it just, it messed with my frame of reference in almost every way. And it's interesting that you, that you sort of alluded to the fact that, um, you become a performer in your own life, you know, depending on how people perceive you and what what role they want to put you in, and and that mirrors the experience of uh, a lot of the migrants on the on the boat who are trying to figure out how do I perform, how do I, you know, make myself into something that is going to be desirable or acceptable at the other end of this voyage. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the book is basically, you know, it's, it's in my mind, it's a repurposed fable. It's the story of Peter Pan reinterpreted as a story of a contemporary child refugee. But it's also a book that unless you're intimately familiar with Peter Pan and the life of J.M. Barry, it's not going to come screaming out at you from, from the text. Um, but in my mind, it's a book that takes place at the sort of collision point of two fantasies. One pointed towards the part of the world where I grew up in, which says all these people are barbarians at the gate and we need to stop them at all costs. Even if we wreck our own society in the process, even if we become deeply cruel, doesn't matter. And then there's a fantasy headed in the other direction that says, if I can just make it to the West, everything will be okay. And both of these fantasies collide right where this migrant ship is crossing the Mediterranean. And the power of these fantasies is, is so great that reality becomes subservient to it whatever the world really is, takes second place to what these people need the world to be. Um, so that's the, the sort of makeup of the book on a sort of psychological level, I suppose. I, I want to return to the um, notion of fantasy and fable um, towards the end of the interview, but I'm, I'm curious about um, you know, how you move from journalism to fiction, because it's a cliche that often turns out to be absolutely true that every journalist has a manuscript in the uh, uh, drawer, desk drawer beside the bottle of scotch. Uh, you may not have had the bottle of scotch, but uh, so how did you go from journalism, take that, that leap? I didn't have the bottle of scotch, but to make up for it, I had three manuscripts, three thoroughly unpublishable manuscripts. Um, fiction's always been my first home. Uh, I think for people who have my kind of very disjointed background, from the age of about five or six, fiction was my place of retreat um, because you can, you can go into that world and you can move the contours around to fit your experience. Um, and that's followed me through from my first earliest stories as a child all the way to my first novel, American War, uh, What Strange Paradise. One of the first things I do is I mess with geography. You know, in American War, I drowned the Eastern Seaboard. I got rid of Florida. I moved things around. I gave the Southwest back to Mexico. I did all of this stuff. Um, 
in What Strange Paradise, half the story is taking place on the eastern edge of Crete, but I, there's no reference, there's no overt reference, and I've changed all the flora and fauna. It's all fantastical. You actually had a map. Did, did you not of Crete? And you mapped the, the uh, path that the, uh, the two protagonists took as they wound their way to try to get uh, off the island. Yeah, I did. I, I got a, a wall map of Crete and it's full of little post-it notes and a little line drawing up. And, and um, I, I'm, I'm very visual in my structuring of, of these books. Uh, which is to say, I'm very, I'm very bad at every other kind of structuring. So I sort of retreat into something I can see, um, and this is what I did here. Yeah, I, I, I would, had, I, I, I would really argue with you on the on the question of your structuring, and we'll and we'll dive into that a bit. But um, you know, just just off the top, journalists uh, have, for the most part, fairly conventional ways of telling stories. You know, you know the term pyramid structure and everything else and you start with the lead and, and so on. But every fiction writer has to approach a project, uh, a creative act with the question, how do I tell this story? The, the, the story is, it's great, but how do I tell it? And I'm interested in how you um, encountered that notion of how do you tell the story? And, and then how you arrived at the structure you did. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, with the three unpublishable novels that I wrote during my time at the Globe and Mail, wrote those in my spare time and they were awful and they will never see the light of day. Um, and then I wrote the two, I wrote American War while I was still working at the Globe. And I wrote What Strange Paradise after I'd quit the Globe. And with all of those, with all five, and, and the one I'm working on right now, which will, again, it's gonna take years to, to sort of complete, but I always know the opening scene and the closing scene, and I have no idea why. Um, you know, in some cases, there's a little bit of cheating going on. In some cases, there's obvious symmetry, um, but I always know how I'm gonna open the story and how I'm gonna close it. And everything in the middle is fog. Everything in the middle, I have no idea what I'm doing. And so as I go through the drafts, I've become pretty, you know, pretty certain now after, after two and a half manuscripts of, of the having this happen, which is after a certain point. So in the case of What Strange Paradise was draft number four, where I realized that I was telling the story chronologically, starting from the moment the book opens with a child who's a sole survivor of a shipwreck. I was telling it chronologically from that point on, but I kept hitting these points where what happened would make no sense unless you knew a little bit of Amir's backstory, the child, the central protagonist. So I would cut into these flashback sequences that were very disjointed and they were just sort of killing the flow of, of, of the storytelling. And at one point I was, you know, one of the things that really influenced me when I was, when I was working on this was a lecture series by Northrop Fry from about 30, 40 years ago. It's called Literature in the Bible, but really it should be called Northrop Fry talks about whatever he wants because he's a legend, he can do that. And at one point he's sort of, he's talking about the nature of the Old Testament, New Testament, this idea of like the grounding of, of one book being that it's proven by the other and the grounding of the other book being that it's uh, prophesized by the other and that sort of circular relationship between texts. And I thought, you know, I'm going back and forth between a very Old Testament, New Testament kind of thing, a miraculous rebirth, and an exodus from Egypt, why don't I try to codify that in some way? And that was when the before and after alternating chapter structure fell into place, which was draft four, draft five. And once that happened, it solved a bunch of technical problems. It gave me a bunch of other technical problems. Like for example, you can't alternate chapters and have 15 chapters of one kind and three of the other. Like you have to sort of make that work. But once that fell into place, everything else became easier to do on a structural level. It made my life a lot easier going forward. Well, uh, we'll return to craft a bit later, but uh, maybe, maybe we should um, just dive into the novel a little bit. And, uh, you know, basically we've got uh, people smugglers taking refugees by a boat from Egypt to Greece. Um, and on that boat, uh, actually, I don't even know how many uh, 
passengers there are, it feels like there's maybe up to a hundred or something like that, um, below deck and above deck and crammed the way we've come to understand and, and witness um, those, those kinds of ships. And, um, and then there's this cast of characters, mostly men. How would you describe that central core uh, cast? So a lot of the book takes place on a boat that's crossing the Mediterranean. And there are the way that this works in real life and the way that it works in the story is that if you are trying to make it to Europe via this passage, um, particularly from North Africa, but really from anywhere, the darker your skin is, the more likely you are to die. And if you talk to any of these human struggler, the smugglers who are profoundly bad people, they will tell you, and you can, you can look up interviews, they will always tell you that this is a money thing. You know, if you have enough money, you get to be on the top deck. And otherwise you get on the bottom deck. And if you're on the bottom deck and something goes wrong, you're much, much more likely to drown. But the reality is the skin color of the folks on the top deck is much lighter than everybody on the bottom deck, almost universally across the board. And so what you got is mostly Arabs, and North Africans um, on the top deck. There's a Palestinian guy, there's a couple of Egyptians, there is a Syrian guy. Um, and those characters are all there for vastly different reasons. Uh, I talked about this idea of like structural things coming to me in various drafts that helped. One of the structural things that came that absolutely did not help in the book is that I decided at one point that I was gonna write the backstories. I was gonna write monologues from each of these people's perspectives. And I thought this would be an amazing thing to put in the book, wrote them all about 30,000 words, put them in the book, immediately realized it wasn't working, took them out of the book. Um, but they're, they're all on that boat for different reasons, but they all share this notion that if they can get to the other side, they will at the very least be left alone. And so in their characteristics, these human beings are very much based on slivers of personalities of the people I grew up around in the Middle East um, and conversations I overheard and so on and so forth. But they're all joined in this idea that if I can just make it over there, at the very least, I will be left alone. Um, Maher, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, is an English teacher. Uh, Teddy, who's kind of um, conscripted to help steer the boat, is a mathematician. Uh, Kamal, uh, I, I hope I have this all right, Kamal studied uh, economics. Is that a typical group for a re refugee ship? I mean, the short answer is no, because there's no such thing. Um, I mean- As a typical group. It's, yeah, it's, it's the nature of why you're leaving is such a deeply personal thing. I mean, in the case of my father, it was a combination of, I can't find work here and I can't complain about it too much because I'll be dragged to the secret prison and that'll be it for me. There's a lot of people whose, whose reasoning overlaps with that, but not everybody. Um, you know, there's, there are people fleeing horrible, horrible persecution. There's people who just wanna make more money. There's people who have heard complete fantasies about what the West is like and have bought into it. And so you're left in this situation. I mean, I remember a lot of what happens on the boat in terms of dialogue, sort of verbatim from some conversations that either I've been a part of or I've sort of overheard as a child that the grown-ups arguing about. And I remember at one point, I forget which part, but I, I, I assume it refers to Maher. Um, one of the early readers of the manuscript said, you know what, I don't buy that Arabs would talk like this, which is a valid criticism, except that I'm Arab and I talk like this. And so you're sitting there going, I have a choice to make now, right? is I can either move everything towards the impression of, of who these people are, or I can keep it with, with at least my experienced reality of who these people are. And there's a real downside to that. The downside is that people will read it and not buy it. And, I, and I, at one point I had to, it was a fork in the road and I had to decide. And I decided that I was going to keep them as I remember them being. But that's not, 
a good or bad choice in terms of the quality of the final product. It's just something you have to decide on one way or the other. There's one uh, character, maybe the main character in a sense, the, the, the foil around which so much happens on the boat. And um, you talked about the smugglers as um, being um, evil, evil um, people. And uh, Mohammed is described as a smuggler's apprentice. I thought that's a very ironic term, a smuggler's apprentice. Can you um, talk about how you see him? Yeah, he's um, so he, he's the Captain Hook of my uh, of my boat chapters, and then Colonel Kethros is the Captain Hook of my of my island chapters. Um, he is a human being who um, feels like he doesn't have the privilege of believing in fantasies the way he feels everyone else on this boat has the privilege to believe in fantasies. He's done this trip enough times now. You know, he's a hyper-capitalist, effectively. He's, he's doing this because he wants to work his way up the ladder and he wants to run his own fleet one day. And, and this is how you sort of get to do that. Um, but he is also a human being who, who has seen enough of these stories not work out. And he is privy with this curse of knowing what the other side of this journey looks like. You're not going to Hollywood. It's not all sort of Big Macs and movie stars. You are going to be horribly mistreated. And best case scenario, you're going to be expected to be eternally grateful to always be the grateful migrant who's just happy to be there. And so he knows this with a level of clarity that these other people on the boat cannot possibly have because they're not, they haven't made that trip as often as, as he does. So he's bitter. He's bitter and he thinks these people are hopelessly naive. And the way he masks that bitterness is by trying to keep it as sort of, as much of a business relationship as possible. Just sit down, shut up, we'll get there, it'll be over. And whenever that's violated, he responds with a deep sense of anger because, again, he's privy to a kind of information about the other side that these people are not. Uh, I don't know whether you have the book handy, but there is a, a, a very short section, a paragraph that if you could read, um, it, it comes from Mohammed and it gives us a pretty good sense of his take on things. Sure, yeah. So this is... Um, closer to the end of the book, I suppose. Uh, and it's after a, a fairly confrontational moment on the boat where um, Muhammad, the smuggler's apprentice effectively um, loses his cool. And, and he basically screams the following at, at the folks around him, the, uh, the migrants. You sad, stupid people, he said. Look what you've done to yourselves. The West you talk about doesn't exist. It's a fairy tale, a fantasy you sell yourself because the alternative is to admit that you're the least important character in your own story. You invent an entire world because your conscience demands it. You invent good people and bad people and you draw a neat line between them because your simplistic morality demands it. But the two kinds of people in this world aren't good or bad. They're engines and fuel. Go ahead, change your country, change your name, change your accent. Pull the skin right off your bones, but in their eyes, you will always be engines. In their eyes, they will always be engines, and you will always, always be fuel. He really represents the, the polar extreme of, of cynicism and realpolitik. Um, prior to that, there, there's a conversation amongst uh, the cast of characters that we talked about a bit earlier. And it's, it's almost like a philosophy slash political science slash economic seminar. Um, but it, it really does seem to me to center on a dialectic between cynicism and hope. And those dialectics kind of play out throughout the book in, in different ways. Kindness versus cruelty hope versus despair, fantasy versus reality. Is, did you have that in mind as you um, put these forces in opposition to one another? 
I think so. I think it was there from the beginning. Um, I mean, you know, one of the one of the things you have to sort of stare down and make a decision on when you're writing this kind of book is, um, you know, the, the, the sort of foundational piece of MFA advice in this part of the world is show, don't tell, right? And um, when you're writing a book that's kind of living in that weird overlapping space between cultures, um, you know, I've published two novels. I published American War, which I think of as a very Arab book that just happens to be set in, in America uh, or in the United States. And then I published What's Strange Paradise, which I think of as a very Western book that happens to be set in, um, in, in sort of the Arab world for the most part and, and in the Mediterranean. Um, I, I was thinking a little bit about these, these collisions. You continually hit these collision points of kindness and cruelty, of hope and despair. And the fact that I had to go into them knowing that it would be inevitably an asymmetric reading experience, particularly for the Western reader, because there are parts of this book that really feel like telling, not showing. And the parts of the book that are showing, not telling are grounded in a kind of cultural knowledge base that is so incredibly thin of an overlap that it disappears in the text. Um, the example I go back to a lot is, you know, towards the beginning of the book, Vana, who's one of the central characters who, who grows up on this Western island, she's upset because the nightclub down on the beach keeps playing the same rap song over and over again. And I never stated explicitly, but the, the, if you read between the lines, the rap song is Big Pimp Pimp by Jay-Z. Okay. Towards the very end of the book, there's a storm coming, the migrant ship is being, is essentially dissolving in the water, and one of the characters says, listen, listen, they're playing our music. It's one of the Egyptian characters. And that's because she's listening to the nightclub playing Big Pimpin, which samples a mid 20th century Egyptian pop song called Khusara Khusara. The number of people who, whose knowledge, cultural knowledge base includes Jay-Z's back catalog and mid 20th century Egyptian pop is me and three other people, basically. And so you come up against this, this weird tightrope that's impossible to walk because you either make it apparent and you say it out loud, or you kind of, you show don't tell and then some people don't see it. Well, that's precisely where I wanted to go next because one of my, um, you say that you're not very good at structure and that's uh, patently not true. Um, the, the kind of layers and allusions uh, uh, in this book are rich and uh, widespread and uh, eclectic and and learned uh, and they're and they're embedded in in the text uh, one of my favorite Canadian novels is not wanted on the voyage by um, Timothy Finley and um, I fell in love with John Milton in university much to my absolute surprise and shock I thought oh god I hope we don't have to study John Milton um, and I read Paradise Lost and found this most marvelous, dramatic, provocative um, story. And uh, it's uh, throughout Not Wanted on the Voyage. There are uh, reverberations and references to Paradise Lost. And if you catch them, and that's just lucky that I, that I did, it's richer. But if you don't, it's still a great reading experience. Do you, do you care whether people get those illusions? Um, I'm you... always happy when it happens. Um, but it's funny you should bring up Milton because I had the exact same experience. You know, I hope, I hope to God we don't study Milton because I came up through the British educational system, GCSEs and all of that, where these people are presented to you as saints. And I, I always think that it would be it would stick so much more in, in the kids' minds if you presented them as irredeemable sinners. Um, but instead you get this sort of, you know, they're presented to you with, with a halo around. Paradise Lost is the only, I think, the only text that's quoted directly. There's a line from Paradise Lost that's quoted directly in What Strange Paradise. Um, Do you remember the line? Oh, to a lower deep than lower still. Uh, it's, it's, there's a moment where the boat goes down. It's the final before chapter. And there's a section there where I describe 
um, Amir basically falling off the boat and, and going to the bottom of, of the sea and then resurfacing. Um, thematically, that section is based on the book of Nicodemus, which is part of the Apocrypha, um, the books that didn't quite make the Bible. And, and the thing about the book of Nicodemus, which nobody has read and nobody really has reason to read, is that it has an alternate sort of telling of what happens to Jesus between the moment of death and the moment of resurrection. It goes down into hell, draws confession from everyone, leads them out of hell. Uh, but but at a line level, I quote from Paradise Lost in that in that section. It's the only time I use a line from from another text. Um, I used to I used to care a lot more than I do um, about the chasm between my intent and the reading of the book, particularly because American War, my first novel, I intended to be one kind of book. And then it comes out four months into the Trump administration and is read entirely, is given an entirely different reading, almost universally. And it used to really upset me. And now I find it comforting because these things by definition are going to outlive me. And if they're going to outlive me, I would, I would rather they have as many different lives as possible. And not only that, but um, often there are things uh, that a writer is doing that are subconscious and quite often you encounter readers who point something out to you that you didn't even know was there and you kind of go holy mackerel <laughs> you know they discovered something uh, that i didn't didn't understand let me let me yeah, continue exactly on that on that line of uh nicodemus because i didn't of course know i don't know the apocrypha when i discovered that it was um through research only, uh, that it played a role in the book. I was absolutely delighted. So I'm going to pop a bunch of um, other just quick things at you and get you to uh, connect them to their um, to where they come from. So the name of the boat is Calypso. That's not casual. That's not happenstance. No, no. It, very little in the book is casual. That doesn't mean it's good but I failed with intent. <laughs> you know, best case scenario, my failure was intentional. Yeah, originally um, Amir was seven years old and, 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 and obviously the Calypso, the island in, in the Odyssey, so on and so forth. Um, that, that was a, um, yeah, that was a deliberate reference as is, you know, Vanna's last name uh, and her pulling the weed out of the lighthouse that's growing in the lighthouse. A lot of those references uh, date back. Uh, I, I stole quite a bit from the Greeks. Let me, let me go back to Calypso for a second because, um, you know, Calypso music, and again, I researched it, look, looked this up. I'm, I knew about Calypso music. I didn't realize how political Calypso music was in um, challenging the, the the governing powers in in the Caribbean was that also on your mind? It was, but the initial the initial intent had to do with the idea of um, how powerful a delusion can be, how enticing, uh, and how it can lead you to ruin. Um, and then I remember one of the um, the reason that I got to research in Calypso music, which pre which predated the writing of What Strange Paradise, but played a role in the construction of the of the substructure beforehand, was that there was a um, the Egyptian the Arabic translation of American War, my first novel, was a very strange translation. Usually, they just translate the book. This guy decided to put footnotes with his <laughs> guesses at what I was talking about, <laughs> and so at one point, the early on in American War, there's there's these people are living in a shipping container and the rain is hitting the shipping container. And I said that the sound of the rain was like being inside a Calypso drum. And he wrote at the bottom, you know, Calypso is the island where, and I thought, well, that's not what I was thinking about, but I'm going to research now. And I went to, anyway, so I, 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 I decided to look up all the many meanings of Calypso because somebody completely had a different interpretation of, of a, thing, a line in my, in my other book. And then it works its way back into the next novel. I'm, I'm pretty, we just sold the Arabic rights to What Strange Paradise, so maybe he's going to take a shot at this thing. Yeah, <laughs> go buddy, <laughs> yeah. do it. Um, you talked way at the beginning of our conversation, and, and we will eventually get to the point where we can turn this over to, to the audience for questions, 
but um, but this again follows the notion of uh, subtle little references. And that is the mirroring of the Bible, of the Exodus, of leaving Egypt. I mean, that ship could have left any port um, in the Middle East, but it left Egypt. So what was what were you thinking there? There are a couple of reasons. One is that, again, I was going, I was going back and forth in this very sort of biblical kind of setup, and I wanted to codify that. The other is that I know Alexandria really well. Um, and I wanted it, to, I wanted it to be in that place. I wanted to describe that place. Um, and part of the reasoning for that is because I think, you know, obviously, you know, in a very overt way, so much of the book is about xenophobia. And, and one of the easier ways to put that down in writing is to have the big bad Westerner constantly being xenophobic and, and sort of being a cartoonishly villainous kind of character. But my experiences from growing up in the Middle East is that you don't need to be from far away. Um, mm -hmm. The instigating moment that resulted in me thinking about the things that eventually led to this book was in 2012 when I was back in Egypt. And my friend was telling me about how if you're Syrian and you came over here, you had no choice but to come over here. You were basically a refugee to Egypt. They were charging you three times as much for, for rent on an apartment. They were charging were you three times as much for fruits and vegetables because they could hear your accent right away and they knew they could. And if I had been born a few years earlier, I would also have been Syrian. That's how close Egypt and Syria were. We were technically one country for a while. Um, but still, it was possible to do this. It was possible to look at somebody who shares so many of your characteristics, so much communal everything, and to be like, oh, outsider, I can hurt them. I can exploit them and get away with it. Um, and so a part of the book had to take place in Egypt for me because I wanted to talk about that. I wanted to talk about how distance of experience is not a prerequisite for, for this kind of cruelty. So those, those were some of the reasons why I took off from, from Alexandria, as opposed to, for example, going through Turkey, which would have been far, far more common, um, a route or taking off from somewhere else in, else in North Africa, which again would have been, would have been more common. Uh, okay, last one. What's with the giant lizard? <laughs> what the heck? Come on. Yes. Yeah, yeah, my crocodile, my crocodile of the uh, of the after chapters. Um, the crocodile of the before chapters is just a clock, um, which again is a Peter Pan reference. That is. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I when I got the copy edits, so so you know how it goes through edits with an editor, and then towards the very end, you're just doing line changes, like really small. And I get the notes back from the copy editor and the island chapter is littered with these questions in the margin, just what is cloud stone? I looked up clouds, there's no such kind of stone. I don't know what you're talking about. What are the sunhead squips? That's not a real bird. I looked it up and, and that's because all of the flora and fauna on the island chapter is, is fantastical, it's made up. And that's a very, again, a very deliberate choice, uh, which obviously has to do with the, with the superstructure of the book and, and the arc of the story. Um, but I wanted, I wanted a creature that was, that served the purpose of my of my mythical sort of crocodile type creature. I wanted it to be make believe, and I wanted it to feast on the wings of passing birds. That was very Why? important to me because of what I'm trying to say in this book about movement. Um, you know, I mean, like, look, I'm not, I'm not an apolitical person. I'm sure every once in a while you talk to somebody who is like a hardcore capitalist and they will expound at length about, about the, um, the many benefits of the invisible hand. I'm that person, but for the invisible foot. Uh, I have no respect for borders. I have no respect for the nation state as a kind of sacred entity. And I wanted to get at this idea of what happens to creatures when you clip their wings. And so obviously a lot of the book on a metaphorical level is dealing with that, but then I have this creature going around, you know, eating the birds, but leaving the wings behind sort of thing. Um, and so all of these things, I but should have prefaced also, with this, but, but they're also, not good answers. They're just what I was no, thinking. At the time. Uh, but, but, but there's a climate change aspect to the lizard, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, 
with my first novel, climate change was really overt. You know, again, I, I went to a sea level visualizer, this little Google Maps thing. You can raise the sea level and see which areas of the world get covered in water. And I cranked it up to the maximum level, 60 meters of sea level rise, to see what, what the world would look like. And the map at the beginning of the book is based on that drawing. Right? We had an illustrator kind of go at it uh, based on that as reference material. And everywhere in that book, it's very, very overt. And what I was trying to do with What Strange Paradise is think about climate change and the ways in which the world is changing in that sense, the same way I would write about memory, the same way I would write about love, because I think it's going to be an emotional and psychological component of everything we experience, certainly for the rest of my life, um, and much more so for my children's lives. We know that from the science about how this world is changing. So I was trying to think about, you know, we have a category called cli-fi and, and my books get classified as, as cli-fi. And I was thinking about how, I, I don't want that. I don't, I don't want it to be labeled cli-fi. I want it to be interweaved with the emotional and psychological elements of the book. And so I have the flight paths of birds changing um, and the patterns they make in the sky changing. And these creatures appearing that seem to be hybrids of various other kinds of creatures and their, their appetites changing and all of these things, I didn't want to make an overt part of the book. I wanted them to sit just below the surface. So that's, that's part of the reason why it's a bit of a cryptic creature that's running, running around the island. You've talked about uh, competing fantasies and, um, and you talked about two and uh, I, I'm not going to try to repeat um, them in, in the order that you put them, but it seems to me that there's there's a third fantasy that comes, well, my fantasy and, and perhaps the fantasy of Western readers, uh, which is that um, we, we want to be seen as welcoming, we want to be seen as kind and generous, we we want to be seen as uh, rescuers and saviors in some sense. And ultimately, a lot of that simply isn't true. And it's almost as though we're called out on that in this book. Yeah, I mean, certainly the character of Vanna, who's, who's the child who, who basically finds Amir when he, when he first stumbles onto this island, um, Vanna for me was my way of talking about a lot of that because here you have this person who is a fundamentally good human being she's this mm -hmm. 15 year old girl she's becoming aware that a lot of her life has been you know a lot of the good fortune of her life has been predetermined by things over which she had no control no say she didn't earn any of this stuff they're just coin flips of history and lineage that have worked out in her favor in terms of the color of her skin, where she was born, where she comes from, et cetera, et cetera. And she's trying to figure out how to be a decent human being in that context. What does it even mean to be good in that context? And she's a teenager who doesn't quite figure it out. She's still in this situation where subconsciously her being a good person is the ultimate goal, not the outcome for this other human being you know, that's important too, but what really matters is me being a good person. And I think, you know, that's, that's sort of, it's a difficult thing to talk about because you want people to be kind. And I don't want to write an anti-kindness book. I don't think that does anything for anyone. The thing about kindness is that the vast majority of the time, it necessitates an uneven playing field. When you reach a hand down to help someone, the playing field is already uneven by definition. And so I think a lot of, a lot of the book was influenced by, by my thinking around this idea of living in this part of the world, how paramount we make individual agency, uh, at, at, sometimes at the expense of institutional change. And I know those things are related, but this idea that if you can be empathetic enough or kind enough, or individually good enough, you can solve systemic issues, is I think one of the fantasies that's sort of running, running through this book. And it, it kind of shapes what I uh, perceive as um, 
as a, a one of the goals of but well not even a, necessarily a goal but one of the possible concrete outcomes which is simply you reminding us not to look away don't look away pay attention to this because things come they're in the news a day and they're gone something else comes and this book is saying don't look away yeah yeah absolutely i people go into novels for very to get very different things out of them I, one of the reasons I, I go into novels, I go into the world of a novel, is to dwell. I think it's a perfect medium for dwelling. And I was writing about, you know, I, I, I write very political books, and they're based on things that are happening and have happened. I didn't invent refugee camps. I didn't invent drone killings. I didn't invent any of these things. Um, and the era that I'm writing in, you know, every writer has to contend with the era they're writing in. The era I'm writing in is to me defined by the privilege of instantaneous forgetting. You get on Twitter, you tweet about how you're outraged about whatever injustice is happening that day, and the following day you tweet about the next thing, and that's how it works. And my medium is, is conducive to the exact opposite. You know, sit with this is basically, I think, the thesis statement of every novel that's ever been written. Um, and so, yeah, that was what I was trying to do. I was trying to sort of strip the reader, at least even temporarily, of that privilege of instantaneous forgetting. Whether I succeeded or failed is an entirely different story, but that certainly was my intent going into it. You, you. This is my um, my last question, um, and then we'll. I've got a list, I think, of uh, questions from the audience, and I'll have to search them at the bar at the bottom, but. Um, you're, you're not necessarily, uh, the book is not necessarily hopeful, but um, I think you've said that um, the act of writing in, in itself represents hope. Yeah, I, um, my very first event as a published author on April 4th, 2017, was at this book club um, where they do, they do this thing, they read the book in advance, and they bring you in. And I was giving this talk and I was very, very nervous. And I did the ill-advised thing that I do whenever I'm nervous in front of a crowd, which is I tried to make some jokes and just crickets, like nothing, no response from the audience. They just looked at me somewhat confounded, except for my editor in the back who's sort of cackling away, nothing else, right? And afterwards I, I, I go up to the person who, who um, organized this thing and I was like, were the jokes really that bad? Like, <laughs> And she said, no, no, they just expected you to be as depressing as your book is. Um, <laughs> and so I think, I think it's, it's an element of, you know, the, the, the conversation about hope has to come in when you write these kinds of books. Um, and for me, hope as a codified obligation to believe in the best possible outcome, regardless the reality, is not hopefulness, it's delusion. And I... I make stuff up for a living, but I don't traffic in delusion. For me, hope is the reaching out. And so it's inherent in the writing of the book. You write this thing, it is a fundamentally hopeful act. I don't care if you're reading The Painted Bird. I don't care if you're reading the most depressing novel that's ever been written. There is an innate hopefulness, almost as a means of survival, that is inherent in the work. And that to me is enough. There's very little of a prescriptive element to anything I write in the world of fiction. There is no, if we do X, Y, Z, things are gonna work out. That's not what I do. I sit with questions and they're just as unanswered by the end of the book as they were at the beginning. And fiction allows me to do that. So I never try to codify hope as a kind of obligation to believe in the best possible outcome. That's not useful for me. Hope is that slight, slight expansion that you may make in the reader's conception of who qualifies as human. And if you can do that, if you can expand that just a little bit, I, don't, I feel no other obligation, uh, no other obligation towards hope or anything else the reader may experience from the book. That is a hell of an answer. Thank you. Thank you. Well, now we get to hear from 
the audience. So this is from Philip, who says, I was surprised to hear you say that from the beginning of the composing process, you knew the closing scene of a novel in progress. As a writer and teacher of fiction, I've always believed that the writing process is a journey of discovery to find out what you have to say. Doesn't knowing the end preclude that journey of discovery? I mean, the short answer is to a certain degree, yes. And, and I wish that the, the, the books didn't come to me this way. And this was true of both, both the published novels um, because both American War and What Strange Paradise are books that if you'd cut the last 15% of the book out and just end it a little earlier, it's an entirely different kind of novel. Um, and I knew that I wasn't going to do that uh, for both books. And so it was in, not only did it preclude some of the discovery, it also made it an incredibly depressing journey because I love these characters. Even the ones I deeply dislike, I love. Um, you know, I don't like the person Surat Chestnut ends up being in American War, but I love her deeply. And we're marching towards a conclusion that I know from the beginning. So in a perfect world, I wish that it was, I wish it was the lily pads that came to me as opposed to knowing the bank that I'm starting on and the bank of the river that I'm ending on, because it's always so much more difficult to figure out the connective tissue um, in between. But I have, I have absolutely no say over this. Even with the thing I'm working on now, which is the opposite of what Strange Paradise structurally. What Strange Paradise, every edit, it got a little bit shorter. Um, and with this thing I'm working on, it's the opposite. It becomes more sprawling. And, but, but I know the beginning and I know the end. Um, and I, I, that's just a feature of who I am as a writer. And I am in envy of anybody who doesn't have that because it's, it is, the journey of discovery is much greater and much re more rewarding, I think, if you, if you don't have that. Well, uh, let me uh, reassure you that I, there are two writers I can think of um, just through personal contact and conversation uh, who, um, have a similar kind of approach around endings. One is John Irving, who's famous for having, I mean, I think he actually has the last line written uh, before he starts the rest of the book. So it's not just the ending, <laughs> it's, it's the ending, it's the final bomb. Um, and Alistair MacLeod, the great Canadian short story writer and uh, wrote No Great Mischief, a, a wonderful novel, said uh, that the ending is like, uh, is like the lighthouse. It's what, um, it's what you head for and you, you know where it is or, or you know what it is. And, and it's just a path to get there. Yeah. So, so there you go. Probably there are many more writers who do that too. Uh, this question is from Myra uh, Novogrodsky. The police officer, uh, his is a world of us and them. Is he evil? Is his function evil in the uh, reason to be very cynical re-change? Uh, so we should probably give a little bit of background to the police officer in Crete. Sure, yeah, so um, there's a character in the island chapters. Once the boy washes up on the island, there's a character who's basically chasing him around. And there's this guy named Colonel Kethros. Colonel Kethros was a military man and he, um, you know, horribly wounded. It was part of a peacekeeping mission many, many years earlier. And now he's sort of been demoted into this kind of babysitting operation where he's on this island and he's constantly chasing the folks who end up arriving on these migrant ships. And Colonel Kethros to me is the, the character who sticks in my mind the most out of anyone in, in this story. Um, he, he is someone who, you know, when I, when I was in high school, I, I had this physics teacher who was obsessed with this idea that you should never memorize formulas. Like you should never just memorize the formula for the arc of a ball tossed or whatever. You should be able to derive it from first principles. So I give you distance, I give you force, you, you figure it out. And I think of Colonel Kethros as a man who 
has memorized the formulas of uh, the formula of, of masculinity, but has no idea how to derive these things from basic principles of kindness or decency or anything like that. He has been given a kind of surface level understanding of what it means to be a man. The kind of stuff that certainly I grew up around, and I suspect many men grew up around, which is the, you know, the firm handshake, look people in the eye, that, that sort of thing, which great, fine. But if you memorize these things, I think it creates a particularly aggressive kind of human being. And so you have this guy who I don't think of him as like fundamentally or exclusively evil. I just think of him as very brittle because anytime this understanding is pierced, this very shallow surface layer understanding, all that's holding it up is violence. So there's a scene where he sees a girl drowning in the, beat, in the sea and he runs and he does the chivalrous thing and he pulls her out and he resuscitates her. And then he slaps her father across the face for not acting with enough decorum in the moment. Because again, his understanding of manhood has been sort of pierced by the moment. Um, and I, I grew up around a lot of men like that. And so it's my way of trying to sort of explore that kind of man when he is given a small amount of power, which is the most dangerous amount of power you can give a man, what does he do with it? Um, that for me is what Kethros represents. Uh, this question is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, could you say more about going into a novel as, quote, a place to dwell, unquote? Yeah, I was, I was trying to think, think about this the other day. Um, I was talking to a bunch of students. I'm, I'm the writer, the virtual writer at res in residence at Queens, Queens University up in Kingston, my alma mater right now. So I was doing these classes virtual classes and they're asking me about some of my favorite novels. And so I was telling them, you know, like A Death in the Family by James Agee is, is pound for pound, I think sentence for sentence, probably my favorite novel. Um, virtually everything Toni Morrison ever wrote, but in particular Song of Solomon. And, you know, I'm listing off these novels. And um, what I'm finding is that I'm having a really hard time explaining why I like these books. You know, I'm ranting and raving about, about a death in the family. And I can't explain to you. I can't explain why. The sentences are beautiful. The prologue is incredible. Emotionally, there's a kind of surgery to it. It's a very surgical aspect. But that's not quite it. And I think for me, it's because when I, when I come out the other side of a novel, and I like the vast majority of books I read. I love very few of them, and I hate very few of them. But I like the vast majority of novels that I read, when I come out of them, it's not so much like the narrative thread. You know, you talked about Irving. When I, I love the world according to Garp. It's about a guy's life. You know, we meet him at the beginning and we go all the way through to the end or even before the beginning, I suppose. I can think of a couple of scenes, one incredibly sort of profane, violent one. There's a couple of scenes that kind of still resonate, but mostly it's kind of the aftertaste of the book which is a much harder thing to, to sort of put into words. And I think one of the reasons that's the case for me is because I don't think of reading as a kind of um, sequential, straightforward act. I think of it as going into the world of the book and staying there for a while. And a lot of my favorite novels, I think of as a form of shelter. You know, I read A Death in the Family shortly after my father died, and the whole book is about a family who the, the father, the, the sort of patriarch dies, and, and the aftermath of that. And I took shelter in this fictional depiction of something very close to what I had experienced. And it was, there's almost an element of cowardice associated with that. You know, it allowed me to, to not face the real thing. But this is what I mean by dwelling. It's, it's a sort of safe harbor and I sit with these things and I sit in these things. Um, and what resonates afterwards is the same thing as when I go to a city that, that resonates with me. I can't tell you the street names really. I can't tell you like, oh, you really need to go to the opera house in Vienna and see it. It's just a thing of being there. Uh, and I think the same is true with, with novels. So that's a very sort of Ill, Ill formed answer to that question. Uh, this is the last question we have from uh, Douglas uh, Tyndall. 
pre-American war, I've been wondering uh, if from your current vantage point, you might see your view of the uh, union's longevity as too optimistic. And either way, where do you currently see hope in the American political <laughs> and cultural landscape? Yikes. Yeah, right. That's a good question to end on. Okay. Um, right after American War came out, a few months later, I got um, this document from Knopf, my publisher, which was a list of responses and sort of semi blurbs from indie booksellers, just their reactions to the book. And one of them was from an indie bookseller in Texas who wrote something like, you know, American War shows why a second civil war would be brutal and bloody and why it is necessary. And I thought, really? You thought this was a pro-war book? That is an interesting take. Um, and that's when I knew I was, I was in for a ride. Um, that book has been read in almost like a lot of different ways, some of them the exact opposite of what I intended. Um, somebody complained recently that it was a pro-Trump book because the states that secede are Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, so MAG, and he thought that was a reference to MAGA. And you can't go to every person on Twitter and say, listen, this book was written years before any of this was a thing. Um, so it's been, it's been read in very different ways. Um, funny enough, the union's sort of survival was the last thing on my mind because what I was trying to do was superimpose another people's story onto the United States. And that's what I meant when I talked earlier about American War being a very Arab book. If I had called it Middle Eastern War, I guarantee you, A, it wouldn't have sold nearly as many copies, and B, the reaction would have been entirely different. And so I was trying to invert a trick that I've seen in the other, in the other direction a million times. You know, I loved Casablanca. I didn't really learn a damn thing about North Africa from watching Casablanca. It was understood that the place was the table, and the tablecloth being laid on top of it was somebody else's story. And I was trying to bring the tablecloth over from my part of the world and lay it on the loudest table on earth. So if I'd written the book 100 years earlier, I would have had to call it British War, because the point was not to set it in the United States. The point was to set it in the heart of the empire. Um, but of course, like since then, it has taken on a life of its own. Um, they keep changing the screenplay for the movie adaptation because real life keeps getting in the way. And so they keep sort of having to reinterpret things. Um, Damn. I, yeah, exactly, right? I'm, I'm waiting to get paid, basically. Um, <laughs> but I think for me, the, the, the sense of hope, the only real sense of hope in a very dark time for this country is that it, I think it's increasingly having no choice but to face down what it really is and decide once and for all whether it can live with this level of antagonism and xenophobia and all of these things that are essentially were around during the first civil war. These are, these are trace elements of things that have been here for a long time. I think right now it's becoming loud enough that this country has no choice but to stare it in the eye, which is something this country has been very good at not doing. And once you stare something in the eye, that's a prerequisite for doing something about it. So that for me is the only source of hope. Otherwise, I'm terrified. I'm terrified of what the next few years are gonna look like. Well, it's, it's really interesting because if we had had this conversation two, three weeks ago, I would have been the typical uh, complacent Canadian saying, uh, yeah, we're all happy here and everything's calm and peace order and good government and hurrah, hurrah, mild people that we are. Uh, and now we're going through a crisis of uh, conscience and examination um, where it will all end up and how we will resolve those kinds, the, the questions that have come up. And for those who are not paying close attention to Canadian politics, we have basically the capital city uh, occupied by uh, an invading force of um, uh, political anarchists on the right, on the right wing. Uh, and we can't seem to do anything about it or haven't solved it yet. Um, and that's just so un-Canadian. I mean, we, 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 in our, you know, recent history, so an illusion 
and delusion has been dashed. And now we've got to, as you say, you have to face it. Yeah, yeah, one way or another, you have to come to terms with the notion that these particular spheres, they have hard ideological borders. They have very blurry geographic borders. Yeah. Uh, none of these people have been stopped from watching Fox News. They can get it pretty easily, you know. So yeah, uh, for me, it comes back to that idea of one of the reasons that I have very limited respect for kind of borders is that when we face these things down, they tend to have ideological borders much more than they have geographical ones. Well, uh, that was the last question. So now I will turn things over to Susan to close the um, this part. There's a little sort of on stage uh, part to follow, I think, but I'll let her uh, explain it all. Susan. Oh my gosh, you guys, this is the most riveting, provocative and substantive conversation. It was really enlightening and interesting. And um, you, you said that was a hell of an answer. Those were a hell of questions too. <laughs> Really, really excellent, Hal. We can't thank you enough for the profound uh, look you, you took at this book and then the questions you came up with. And Omar, it's a great pleasure to meet you and to uh, hear your take on, on all of these really interesting questions. I, I just thank you both for a really substantive conversation. And for those of you who are in the audience, now it's your opportunity to come up on the stage with us. And to do that, press the raise your hand button on your Zoom screen. Just click on raise your hand and uh, you'll be able to come up here and join us for the conversation and meet with Hal and Omar in person, so to speak. Well, uh, Maria, you have come up to join us and welcome. Do you have a question or a comment for Omar or Hal? I'm just really impressed by the conference and uh, by the, the humbleness of Homer to share with us how he writes. That's the only thing I want to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. And mm -hmm. very interesting comments. Uh, I agree with you on style and, and approach to writing. Yeah, thank you, Maria. And Patricia. Yes. Welcome. I, I'm very impressed with Omar and his writings. And um, I would love, I'm in Corona Del Mar, California. I would love for him to come to Newport Beach, where we need open minds and a different view. Um, we're working with a group called um, We Bleed the Same to help understand people and and get people that have different views into the into the community. And thank you so much. It was so interesting. And um, and thank you. That's all I can say is thank you. Thank you. Want a trip to Newport Beach? You Come got on. beach in the title. You you had me at beach. So <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well. Uh, I'll have uh, Kunga uh, uh, contact you because uh, we have speakers come in, authors come in, and we need uh, mind expanding people, people that are, um, I don't know if you're familiar with um, the Braver Angels that are trying to, they're, they're, it's a group that are trying to, to um, get people on both sides to talk together. And they went to actually went to the United States Congress and got a Republican uh, uh, re um, representatives group and a Democrat to sit down and talk and say what they wanted and what they were looking for. And they ended up thinking, well, we're looking for the same thing. We just have different ways to do it. And um, but fiction, as you say, dwells and. Um, Anzar Nafiri's uh, new book, the gal that wrote Reading uh, Louida in Tehran, her new book is about, about how important fiction is. And um, I recommend it to everybody and how, how we, can't, we can't live our lives. And there's so many people that are now banning books and uh, the people that are, I have a lot of um, 
I'm sorry to take all everybody's time, but I have a lot of nephews and nieces that are teachers in Oregon. And one uh, school district has been taken over by people that say the teachers can't say certain words like equality and are giving them, and you know, we've got to get up and say, that's not right. But, but fiction is so important. And if you read the Faris book, um, it's really good. And I think what you're doing, bless you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I had no idea there was a new one. I'll, uh, I'll look it up for sure. Yes, yes. Thank you, Patricia, for your enthusiasm. You're welcome. And, and Barbara, welcome to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, this session as well and uh, was just uh, thrilled actually with the session. Um, I'm uh, from, I live in Ottawa, Ontario. I'm currently in Victoria, BC. Uh, and I saw Omar at uh, the Ottawa uh, Writers Festival promoting your first book. So I'm really happy to hear you talking about this book, uh, which uh, I got for Christmas. And when I finished reading it, I was really eager to present it to our, my book club that I'm a member of. And interestingly and surprisingly, a lot of people turned away uh, from the subject matter, refugees, you know, people drowning, boats. Uh, it was so, and that was, I found that quite shocking um, that um, there was a desire not to deal with such unpleasantness and to look away. So I don't know if you have any comments about that, but um, just one more thing, um, being here in Victoria, BC, just about how, what a kinder, gentler Canada, uh, you know, this, this impression that we have that we are kinder and gentler. Um, for the last few days, there's been, there have been caravans of flag toting uh, people who don't believe in vaccinations or public health measures, um, who have extremely provocative uh, messages for the politicians in Ottawa and so on here in Victoria as well. Um, and so I think that there's um, a myth about our, we have founding myths about our country as well um, that we haven't faced fully as a country. And, um, you know, just as in the US, they haven't really dealt with or just slavery. Um, so our indigenous past, the nature of our colonial um, regime and so on. And uh, so maybe you have uh, some thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I honestly can't blame anybody for turning away from this book. I mean, it's, it's A, there's, there's really, if, you, if you're in this part of the world, there's, there's essentially no consequences to not thinking about this. And, and mm -hmm. I, I don't mean that as a moral judgment against somebody who would not read this book. I, it's not, that's not on my mind at all. Um, you know, I, I I spent years with the source material for this thing and it wasn't a pleasant experience. And, you know, one of the reasons there's probably never going to be a sequel to anything I write in the world of fiction is because I don't want to go back to, to the sort of the fictional world around that I've built around a very real thing. Um, I think in terms of this, you know, this notion of, of the impression of Canada as a certain kind of place being shattered by a certain set of events, I have almost nothing remotely profound to say on it because I, because of my upbringing, never thought in those terms. So Qatar, where I spent sort of my formative years, ages five to 16, basically, was only 10% country. 90% of the population had come from somewhere else to cash in on the oil and gas money. And so if you'd come up to me at any point in my time in Qatar and said, what's the national identity of this place? I wouldn't know how to parse that question. And so I, I, you know, I've, I've never really had a sweeping idea of what Canada is uh, or what the U.S. is. I always feel like I'm living in these sort of slightly overlapping circles of ideology and geography and upbringing and the extent to which you live in a community where there's people who aren't like you nearby versus if you live in a community where everybody is exactly like you nearby. Um, you know, I live just south of Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon is one of the most sort of liberal cities in America. You drive 20 minutes in any direction, you'll start to see Confederate flags. Mm -hmm. um, I can't make a statement uh, that encompasses 
uh, you know, other than like alive and breathing, there's nothing I can say about these human beings that would be a, a fully overlapping definition. So it's never been in my mind that Canada is this uh, or Canadians are this. I think that, you know, you are free to ignore this kind of behavior or this kind of ideologically ideology until you hit a kind of brick wall where you can no longer ignore it. And I feel like we've hit one of those moments right now. Uh, what but happens Omar, on the other side of that? But Omar, don't you have to go back to history? Because like in Portland, in Oregon, um, it was it was greatly settled by uh, Confederate soldiers from the Civil War. My brother was the coach of the of the uh, Trailblazers. And at the 150th anniversary, they wanted them to do a big um, thing of it. And he and he's got a master's in history. And he said, um, I better ask the guys if they wanna do that because black people were not allowed on the Oregon Trail. And that's what you have in Southern Oregon. My sister lives in Sherwood and, and, and my brother's still there. And Oregon was, and Oregon and a lot of California was settled by, by the uh, Confederate soldiers that lost. And they came here and brought all their ideas with them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Oregon is the only state in the union that was founded with a no black people clause in its charter. Mm -hmm. um, there is no other state that I know of that had that. They said, okay, we're not going to have slavery, but also here's an addendum. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you find you've, it's weird, right? Because you have the present colliding with history. You have these neighborhoods, incredibly progressive neighborhoods in Portland, where every front lawn has a Black Lives Matter right. sign on it. There's not a black family in no, the neighborhood. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, they've been displaced black. decades ago. So yeah. yeah, it's 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 a collision for sure. Yeah. Well, who knew? That's fascinating about Portland. Well, I'm excited to see Daphna here. I want you all to meet Daphna Rabinovich, who is the engine behind the Giller Foundation, and has uh, been very helpful in bringing the Giller winners to the San Miguel Conference. So Daphne, I'm very happy to see you. Welcome. Well, thank you. I'm only I'm only a twin engine. <laughs> the executive director is my sister. But I first of all, I want to um, thank you, Susan, for for arranging all of this, for you know welcoming Omar and and arranging for Hal. And I I just um, want to say this is the third interview I've actually heard with Omar, and and it never fails to be mesmerizing. I, 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 I just, I, I simply can't get enough of what you have to say, Omar. And, and the, it was a riveting hour, just simply riveting. And it's like getting into the mind of an incredibly humble, yet amazingly thoughtful um, individual, and even that doesn't do it justice. So right. I, I just want to say thank you, Hal, and thank you, Omar, for sharing your your brilliance with us, and thank you, Susan, for for having arranged all this. And thank you, Daphne, for for your part in making this all of this happen. We're so happy about the connection between the the San Miguel Writers Conference and the Giller Foundation because. We're so tricultural, and this just puts a stamp on that. So, yes. do any of you have more comments? Patricia? Yeah, I have a comment. To... Omar, come to Newport Beach. We need you. <laughs> I just wanted to say, as an interviewer, um, and having done a lot and heard a lot of interviews, uh, what you're hoping for is a guest who comes to to play to participate. I don't mean play in the casual sense. I mean, it comes to um, just deal with things as they are. And, and when you hear somebody thinking things through and it's not a rote answer that, you know, you've heard they've said 10,000 times, but they're actually conjuring with something that for me, that's one of the deepest uh, pleasures as a as a interviewer and as an audience member you get that sense that you know this, this is the first time this has been said this is if you weren't here and you missed it it's gone yeah. so 
great. I can imagine that every single interview would bring something different and something amazing. Yeah, but yeah. not every single interview is with Hal Wake. You, know, you bring the A game <laughs> oh, to this kind of thing. So thank you. Oh, appreciate it. Very gracious. <laughs> That's true, Hal. That's true. Yeah. I'm just an old man living in Cowichan Bay, just uh, north of Victoria on Vancouver well, I feel sorry for anybody who missed out on this really scintillating evening. And, and well, it's Super Bowl, man. Oh. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> We did much better than the Super yeah. Bowl. They yeah. act like it's important. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you both so very much for a wonderful evening. Thank you all for coming up on stage and the rest of you in the audience. Uh, I, I know you enjoyed this evening. So we'll say good night now to everyone and we'll see you for our, our final distinguished author presentation will be in March. <laughs>